Good afternoon and welcome. I am so excited to be hosting the first ever startup showcase here at Data Connect. And I'm joined by three amazing panelists, VCs, um, who will be providing us feedback for today's session. I really want to just say a big thank you to everyone in the audience for listening in and attending. As we all know, we need more women in data careers, but more importantly, at the forefront of that change, driving the innovation and the companies that are needed to accelerate this change. So today, we're so excited um, to showcase three of the amazing startups that applied to be a part of this, to share the work that they're doing and provide feedback. So our goal today is to be able to amplify their voices, support them as a community, and to accelerate change. But before we get started today, I want to introduce our amazing panelists. Um, we have three incredible women joining us today who not only have been working in the startup scene, but also are funding those startups and making sure that they're getting the support that they need to succeed. Our first panelist is Suchi Reina. She is the head of Global White Space at ServiceNow and leads their venture fund there as well. She has over 20 years experience in Silicon Valley, leading many corporate venture funds. Please join me in welcoming Suchi. Next up, we have Monique Brown. Monique Brown is the co-founder and managing director of The Growth Factory. And The Growth Factory has a venture fund as well as a startup accelerator with it. And they're all focused on having a backyard advantage and making sure that those pre-seed and seed startups get the support that they need to be able to be successful. Please join me in welcoming Monique. And last but definitely not least, uh, we have a very special guest for us <laughs> filling in, as you can probably notice by the slides. Um, we have Fallon Donahue. She is a partner at Naria and a founder of what has already become my favorite venture fund, Sadie Ventures. <laughs> I've already asked how I can be a part of it and fund it. I did not know such thing exists, so this is why we have these conversations. <laughs> um, but thank you, Fallon, for coming in and joining us today. All right, well, let's get to the good part, which is three amazing startups are going to give us a five-minute pitch each. So we are going to keep them on track. As we all know, sticking to time is difficult. Um, but I really appreciate everybody's full support, listening to these pitches, providing feedback, and are excited for a really engaging conversation here today. So please join me in welcoming our first startup, Match TX. Hello, um, my name is Victoria Lovingard. I am Chief Analytics Officer of MatchTX, and right here, my CEO, Jeff Spitzner, and our CTO and Data Wizard, Trevor Allen. He, I am here to introduce MatchTX, the innovative software as a service platform for in the field of precision oncology. The problem, the problem is, 1.8 million people are going to be diagnosed with cancer this year alone. That's a big problem. The uh, cancer treatments are getting better, but we have a long way to go still. The therapies and the clinical trials are often very expensive, and uh, they don't yield the results which we really want. That's where uh, much TX comes in with its uh, patent and technology to predict the failures or successes of clinical trials or therapies specific to the patient. So uh, what is our secret sauce? Our secret sauce is uh, our patented analytics algorithm. We use clinical and genomic data, both public domain and uh, uh, pro pro proprietary. Uh, uh, we um, use this uh, clinical and genomic data just to discover predictive biomarkers, and we use our software as a service to learn from the world, uh, real world outcomes. We predict which drugs or clinical trial uh, are the best for the new patient. 
for each patient, the proprietary engine predicts treatment outcome based on genetically similar past patient tumors. So, uh, we can select, based on this, the patients could be selected to participate or not to participate in a clinical trial or treatment, therefore reducing uh, their own pain and suffering and giving them more time to do a different treatment and also saving a lot of money. So we have a huge market potential. 160 billion current tumor diagnosis market. Uh, the genomics market is growing at 21%. Oncology uh, drugs growing at 7.5%. 17,000 cancer drug clinical trials. 50,000 clinical cancer research projects in the United States alone. Our market uh, is uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, researchers, hospitals. Uh, we're also looking for strategic partners. We provide uh, software as a service. Uh, each project is one drug or one uh, cancer type. Uh, we start with pilot projects and then we expand uh, to individual projects per drug per client. Uh, we anticipate 500 to 200K per project per year. Our competitive advantage, we are very proud of our competitive advantage because we have a patented algorithm uh, which uh, we validated on uh, over 10 large cancer uh, patient data sets. Uh, we uh, had six pilots, pilot projects. We own our six pilot project right now. We're targeting one million in sales pipeline in deal closing in the next 12 to 18 months. And uh, in about three to five months, we would like to exit. The market is hot. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see all of the uh, recent mergers and acquisitions in our space. Um, we are asking for investment, 500K, to support our uh, current cli uh, client and pilot projects, to hire uh, new talent, uh, data scientists, programmers, to support our technology expenses, and uh, uh, to support our marketing and uh, customer projects. Hey. So the much TX, in conclusion, in summary, we are innovative software as a service company with uh, patented algorithms which find predictive biomarkers to customize to customized treatments and uh, clinical trials for patients, thus uh, helping patients and uh, reducing costs. The future of cancer is data. The future of cancer data is much TX. <laughs> Suchi, let's start with you. What feedback or questions do you have? Yes. Well, thank you for what you're doing. And I lost my mom to cancer, so this is I am very a survivor myself. close to my heart. But just wanted to get, um, can you talk a little bit about more about data? Where are you getting the data? Um, sure. Uh, well, we get some data from uh, sites like TCGA. It's a uh, cancer data. We also get uh, data from the universities. Uh, uh, our current um, project, we're working with a large university who provides them, uh, our, provides the data for us. Okay, and perhaps um, there are some pilots that you mentioned, right? Proof of concepts? I'm sorry? Some pilots, proof of concepts that you spoke about. Yes. Uh, could, you, could you tell us a little sure, bit more sure. about what um, was the outcome and... Um, yeah. Like uh, the current pilot we're working on, they provide us with a uh, um, uh, large volume of um, genomic data mm -hmm. for particular patients, as well as uh, um, demographic data. So what we do, we analyze this data, we find links between genomic and demographic data, we combine it, and then we group the patient based on the similarity of genomic and demographic data. 
Okay, great. Well, I want to give others an opportunity to yeah, Monique. Come in. Great, thank you, um, th and thank you for thank your you. presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about your team. Oh, my, uh, we have a fantastic team. They're sitting right here. Um, our CEO is the father of this whole concept. He has PhD in genomics, and uh, uh, it, it's uh, his idea, basically, because that's what he has been dealing with, and that's what he has been studying uh, uh, most of his career. And then we have our very talented data wizard scientist who actually developed the platform from, uh, from start uh, to, to finish, uh, who uh, brought to life the patented algorithms I'm talking about. So they're sitting right here. Who, who is leading your sales or your customer relationships? Uh, that would be my CEO. Okay, thank you. Bradley? Um, great to meet you, and thank you for the important work that you're doing. Um, maybe just share a little bit, you know, following your successful pilot projects, your go-to-market strategy, and how you're finding customers. Uh, maybe uh, Jeff can help me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, our successful project, uh, our, our pilot project is... Uh, that's the one we are currently working on, and uh, uh, we hope f to find the patterns which we were talking about to, uh, in, in the data, and then we will present this to um, our, uh, our customer. That's, that's the current pilot project we are working on. I don't know if I'm at liberty to mention which university we are working with. No? Okay. I'm not. Awesome. Thank you very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank quick, you. quick, one qu more question. Um, have any of the pilots converted to like a sale? Or? Oh, they, you know, uh, it's kind of a little bit of a long story. They almost did in 2020. Uh -huh. And then COVID hit. Ah. And everybody went into hibernation. Sure. Okay. Perfect. Great. Please join me in congratulating Victoria and Thank Match TX. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm excited to introduce our next startup who will be pitching Scheduler AI. As you can guess, this has something to do with all of our dreaded calendars. So please join me in welcoming Scheduler AI. Hey guys. All right, so my name is Maddie Bell. I'm the co-founder of Scheduler AI. And we like to say that we obsess over scheduling meetings that matter so that your team doesn't have to. Every day, we see companies spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to drive meaningful connection with their clients. And while all these connections are very different, there's one thing most of them have in common. Meetings, <laughs> right? We gotta have meetings to connect with people. But unfortunately, when it comes to meetings, scheduling kind of sucks, right? Because people are busy. Platforms are delayed, teams are dispersed, and plans often change. And unfortunately, popular solutions only shift the problem. One-way scheduling links place the burden on the receiver, calendar comparison places the burden on the sender, and polls just spread it all out around everybody. Which is actually costing your business millions of dollars in lost revenue and productivity. Don't believe me? Let's play a little game. How long do you think it takes your company to respond when a prospect or client reaches out to schedule time with you? A day, a few hours, 30 minutes? The data would suggest that if you don't schedule in the first five minutes of a client request, your chances of booking time with them plummet by 80%. Yet the reality is most companies take a day or more to even respond. Okay, maybe you, maybe you do that though. Oh, here's another question. On average, what percent of your client meetings would you say get rescheduled? Is it high, is it low? 40% of client facing meetings need to be rescheduled and only some do and that means lost deals. Now last question. On average, how many group meetings would you say it takes your company to close a deal? On average, it takes four group meetings across three time zones. So when you think about all of this that your people are doing, 
How much time would you guess your teams are wasting every week just scheduling meetings? The answer, four to five hours a week. And it just keeps adding up. And that's because scheduling doesn't start with a calendar. In most cases, scheduling starts with a message. And that's why we created Scheduler AI, an AI scheduling assistant that makes scheduling effortless everywhere messages are sent. Scheduler can coordinate meetings and reschedule in seconds. And it integrates into all of the platforms that your business is already using. So for example, it can propose your first available times in your web forms. Or where it gets most exciting is when you use it in email. It's easy. All you do is add scheduler to an email, add the people you want to schedule a meeting with, and say something like, scheduler, so just an hour for us this week. Scheduler will then check your calendar and propose the time to people outside of your organization. Now they can respond back, accept the time, choose something else. But in this case, let's say she responds back. Can we do February 28th before 1 p.m. Eastern instead? Unfortunately, you might not be at your desk. You're probably busy, but it's not a problem because Scheduler is on CC. It's going to read that note, it's going to interpret the scheduling command, and it is going to adjust the meeting while adding video conferencing so that you don't have to worry about it. It's also going to remind your clients that you have a meeting. And like we said, when plans change and they say something like, can we push to next Monday between 2 p.m. and 5 p.m. Eastern? Once again, it's going to handle it and make sure your calendar stays up to date and the meeting stays on the books. But that's just the start. Scheduler can route pool team availability and sync time zones with a single message. In this case, we've got Sam, he's bringing his friend Mike, and he says something new. Scheduler, propose a few times for a demo next week. Scheduler is going to grab three times off both their calendars, send it to the client, do the most important thing, which is add the hold so that nobody gets double booked, and then all the client has to do is select the one they want. But let's say that client's really busy and none of these times work. They can click a scheduling link, but this one's different because this one's been customized to the exact command that Sam gave and the exact people from inside his organization on the exact time frame that he requested. So when his client picks, they're doing it on his terms. And all of this is fully integrated into the platforms you're already using, G Suite, Microsoft 365, Slack, text message. And the best news, every single person that uses this can fully customize all of their scheduling preferences based on the words and phrases that they use to schedule meetings. Our AI is patented. It's beating open AI. We're award-winning, client-preferred, and venture-backed. So if you want an AI scheduling assistant, scan here and check it out today. Thank you, Maddie. I, I was going to ask, my first question was, where can I sign up and get this? Because I need this right away right now. Um, but can you just talk a little bit about the sales that you've been doing? Are, are customers using this today? Yeah, so we like to say we like to schedule meetings that matter. And I would venture that most of you guys' meetings that matter most are the meetings that you have with people outside of your organization, your clients. So we focused a lot of our go-to-market on sales and revenue teams, particularly of SaaS companies, as they're working to close deals and meet with clients. But the reality is we have a client base that spans tons of different organizational types because I bet all of you in here have probably scheduled a meeting or two this week. Perfect. Fallon, let's go ahead and start with you. Hi. Um, I'm curious, uh, based on the data you're seeing, what sort of insights are you, do you have access to? And is there anything that surprised you, something that maybe uh, could support a sales team and their efforts, uh, maybe information around rescheduling? Do you think folks are more likely to reschedule a meeting once or more than once if it's an AI instead of a person that they need to reach out to? You know, I think two data points that surprise me most. Number one, 65% of people outside your organization do accept the first time proposed. So when you're able to quickly propose a time, that time does get accepted a lot, which I thought, you know, kind of, what do you mean? I just threw one out there, but it, it, it does happen. Um, the second thing that I was surprised by was when you think about high volume meetings, a lot of times that sales teams have, you spend a ton of money to acquire leads and bring them into your organization. And we're actually seeing a lot of people losing clients just because they don't reschedule. 
So it could be a $50,000 deal lost when the person says, can we do next Friday? And the salesperson just doesn't see it. And then that person goes and buys another product. Great. Um, I just want to compliment you on the use of uh, storytelling and showing the case studies as you walk through your pitch. I think that's always super useful. And in this case, um, I think all of us are probably going to leave here and sign up. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm curious a little bit uh, on the business side of things. So can you talk through kind of your pricing model and then average um, kind of like land and expand within a customer? How do you think about um, number of seats per, per customer and that sort of thing? Yeah, so we're on a per user pricing model. So if you want a scheduling assistant to handle your life, it's $25 a month. And then we do $50 a month sales um, and revenue team kind of automations um, for reps, which have extra features like it can automatically review your inbox. And when someone says, hey, I want to schedule, it can jump right in there. So we have some extra fun automations that we do there. Um, in terms of our go-to-market, uh, we are B2B SaaS, so we do direct sales to enterprise companies. We typically do start in, call it, sales, revenue, customer success, recruiting, and then project management. Um, so that's kind of our motion today. We do have a PLG, kind of what I call the PLG kicker, right? A lot of times what we'll see in an organization is someone maybe from the sales team schedules a meeting and someone says, holy cow, how'd you do that? And then they come talk to me. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great presentation. Um, quickly, wh what stage are you guys at right now, um, from both from a funding perspective and also perhaps revenue that you have? Yeah, so we're pre-seed, post-revenue. Pre-seed, post-revenue. OK, got it. And um, when you think of competitors, is there anyone that comes to mind? Like who? Anyone competing in this? Yeah, space? I mean, there are a lot of a lot of people working on this space. We see a lot of people doing a lot of fun things with calendar links. Um, but what we've seen with calendar links, right, is it's a very one-way binary kind of conversation. You find time on my calendar, mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of the reason why we received our patent. So we do have a U.S. fully granted patent on our ability to integrate our centralized AI into any messaging application with an API. Got it. Thank you. Perfect. Please join me in congratulating Maddie and Scheduler AI. And our last startup who will be pitching today is Five Star Fans. Please join me in welcoming Five Star Fans. Hi, everybody. Um, first, I'd like to say I also need that. I need to sign up for Scheduler <laughs> AI. Um, hi, everybody. My name's Tina Provost. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Five Star Fans. I'm here with my co-founder, Jennifer Bardeen. And we are really excited to talk to you about how technology is able to help us bring college sports fans together. So let's get into it. Really soon, we're going to get it. There we go. OK. So Five Star Fans, two years ago, the Supreme Court ruled that college athletes are now able to make money and monetize off of their own personal name, image, and likeness. So it has been an incredible and wild 24 months. This really was a catalyst to what we're about to show you. We found that the problem is there are 182 million collegiate sports fans in the United States. They are the largest, the most affluent, they have the most disposable income of any fan base in the United States period, but what they don't have is they don't have a unified way to come together as a fan base and show their spirit. On the flip side of that, recruits coming into universities lack a way to really monetize and capitalize on their recruiting decision-making journey. So with technology, we've been able to invent five-star fans. This is a platform that allows fan bases to come together and engage in the recruiting process, and it allows the recruits to monetize their recruiting decisions. And this is how it works. So an athlete's going to sign up, and they're going to choose up to 10 schools that they either have an offer from or that they're being recruited by. Then the fans get to come in, and this is where it's really fun. Fan bases and individuals are going to come in and place likes on the university that they want that particular player to attend. Once that athlete makes a commitment to a university, their profile freezes, and then they will engage in an NIL deal with five-star fans based on the number of likes generated in the school that they chose. So what happens to the rest of the likes and the rest of the money from the schools they didn't choose? 
That's our profit. That's our revenue stream. However, what we get pretty jacked about, this is the best part of it all. We're taking 20% of each of those buckets and we reinvest it back into non-revenue generating athletic programs at those universities. We come from one of those sports and we'll talk about that in a second, but that is really important to us to be able to have this impact on college athletics. So what does our market look like? I mentioned 182 million college sports fans. Those people spend $18 billion on college sports and nearly $8 billion on just licensed sports merchandise. We're going to target 5.5% of those 182 million. Those are the, categorized as these super fans. I'm probably one of them. We're a little bit crazy. We yell OH on the streets. You know who we are. Um, and with this particular business model that you're looking at, we're going to target this 5.5%. This model suggests that those fans are going to spend $10 per fan per year, which gets us to a revenue stream of $100 million in five years by 2027, which is when we plan to exit at that point. So what's going on in this space right now? There are companies and media outlets that literally exist to only talk about high school football recruiting. Some of us probably know about them. One in particular makes $17 million a year. They have 90 employees, and all they do every day is talk about high school football recruits. I'd love for you all to take a guess with a show of hands how much money Dylan Rayola on this post, how much he made from them talking about him. Everyone's putting up no hands because you're exactly right. He made zero dollars <laughs> off of them talking about this all day, every day, not anymore. Two years ago, Travis Hunter was a recruit. He's now with Deion Sanders. He tweeted, he said, when I get to 100,000 YouTube subscribers, I will tell you all where I'm going. He is doing exactly what we built. He is gamifying his decision making and benefiting off of it. We're building that for any recruit to be able to benefit from. So from a competitive perspective, there's media outlets, there are outlets for content for fans to participate. We are more hyper-focused, we're the pink line on this graph. We're hyper-focused on recruits, not current students at this point. We're hyper-focused on fan bases and bringing them together. And we're also eliminating asking athletes to not provide content, and I'll tell you why. As a former student athlete, time has always been a constraint. And back in my day, all we really had was like, maybe Facebook just started to creep in. With all the social media and outlets, Time is a constraint and that will continue to be, so we're not asking athletes to spend more time creating more content, we're gonna do it for them. From a revenue perspective, on the top left, uh, top right, I mentioned the unselected universities. Whatever they don't choose, that is our profit and our revenue stream. We'll also be tapping into advertising revenue, data analytics that we'll be able to aggregate and sell to universities and fan bases as we study behavior and how fans interact, and then interest. The deal for the athlete doesn't exchange until they step foot on campus. So there's typically a six to eight month period of time where we hold that money for them. Um, so we'll be able to generate interest off of that bucket. From a traction perspective, we launched tomorrow, so that's super fun. <laughs> we closed our pre-seed round. We're super juiced about it. Um, We've got five athletes that we'll start to roll out with. We're going to really test and study the behavior with a small group of fans, and we're going to see what it looks like from a go-to-market strategy on just those five athletes sharing to their current networks. And then we'll continue to build on that as we study where fans are coming from, um, from geographies. Um, once we get into Q4, we're going to roll out to basketball recruits, and we'll open up our next fundraising round in August. The team, so when we talk about fan engagement, getting people excited, the best people that know that are a bunch of cheerleaders. So our founding team is made up of three college cheerleaders from Ohio State University, and this is our initial founder, and he's advising us on technology here on this slide. And what we're incredibly proud about is over 50% of our team are former or current student athletes. 50% uh, female and 25% racially diverse. The bottom row is our advisory board. From a fundraising perspective, this is a bit outdated because um, startup world, things change like every day. But um, we've raised 490000 in our pre-seed round, which we've closed. Um, we're building out our UI UX, which launches tomorrow. And we'll be spending additional dollars on marketing and media once we roll into college football season. We would love for you to check us out at 5 starfanscom Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Tina. Who would like to start? I have a, a question about athlete and fan 
um, engagement and how you plan to acquire those athletes and fans onto your platform? That is a great question. So we have three individuals that are, um, one of them sits in the media space where they do podcasting in regional networks talking to fans about recruits. We have an, two and two agents. They are sourcing the athletes for us, talking with their parents, um, and then they'll be uploading them today at four o'clock onto the platform. From a fan perspective, we're really gonna study that. We didn't wanna go blitz until we understood where they're gonna originally come from. We believe a hypothesis we're gonna test out over the weekend is if that athlete, one of them has 60,000 followers on Instagram, we're gonna see what happens when he posts once. And then we're gonna see what he happens when he posts twice. We're gonna watch where those individuals come from. And then um, our CMO is gonna to start to do some target marketing from a fan perspective and some of the affiliate marketing. So if you sign up and you like a, a player for five likes and you share it with five friends, you'll, you'll earn more likes in your bank to play too. Okay. So social media will be a big deal for us. And are the universities having to opt in? So I, you were saying the, the um, likes that they get that to the universities they don't go to. The universities buying into this at all? That's right. Or That's right. Um, do we want to partner with them? 100%. Athletic department distribution lists, alumni associations, their distribution and what they get measured on is engagement. So we do want to partner, but we don't have to. And we're, we're not going to start there um, because we don't have to. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. So just to follow up for clarity's sake, um, the existing social media channels are the primary acquisition uh, platforms for, for fans. For fans. That's right. Okay. Got it. We anticipate um, one of the recruits that you'll see on the platform tomorrow is a number one recruit. Um, we anticipate his peers seeing traction and the ability to monetize their recruiting decision. So we should see some of that peer-to-peer -peer influence, um, but we're gonna continue to be really manual with acquiring the athletes. We wanna talk with their parents, make sure everybody feels comfortable about the process. They are recruits, which means they're still in high school, which means they're under 18. So we're really thoughtful in speaking with their advisors or their guardians on what's gonna happen and what does that mean for their kid. Um, I guess I have a two-parter. One okay. is, what, what's your continued relationship like with the athletes? So once we do the deal with them, we'll have activations. The, the deal doesn't happen until they step foot on campus. Um, that is a one-time marketing activation with us. We don't want them to feel that they are obligated to maintain a relationship. However, we'll of course have that already started and if they want to continue to do that, we'll work with their agent and advisor to do so. Um, but at this particular point, the strategy is marketing activation when they step foot on campus and then that's the deal. And this is sort of an interesting time that we're seeing this legislation pass at the same time that we're seeing uh, the Screen Actors Guild go on mm. strike mm -hmm. uh, because the names and likenesses and yeah. body scans of background actors are being used in perpetuity. They've sort of signed those rights away. How are you thinking about this with athletes, particularly not multi-million dollar going to sign with Nike athletes, but a lot of the athletes that will come through your platform, and generally, how do you see this impacting not only their livelihood, but your business? Yeah, that's a good question. One of the former Heisman, not former, he is a Heisman Trophy winner, former Ohio State, they're talking to them right now about that, because when they were in school, they used their name, image, and likeness all over the place, and now they're talking about how do you back compensate for that. Um, so I, I think I'm hearing, you know, if we are posting on our social media about a player who was on our platform six months ago, how do we continue to make sure that they're able to monetize that? Um, we will get their permissions on any photographs that they upload. They're consenting that we can leverage that in marketing um, for a certain period of time. And then if we need to do additional marketing or if the image looks different or we use it more than we said we were going to, then we owe them a different contract and a different deal. Great. Please join me in congratulating Thank Tina you. and Five Star fans. So as we have just a couple minutes to wrap up today, I'd love to just hear from each of you any general feedback for all of our startups or if there's founders or soon-to-be founders in the audience, what, what feedback do you have for them given you know, the current market conditions and how to be thinking about creating a great product market fit right now? Well, I think they're all trying to solve good problems, but it'll be about... Um, they should definitely go out and talk to the audience that they're trying to acquire 
and test as much as possible with them, with their feedback, just like a typical startup, um, lean startup methodology, right, which everyone I'm sure is familiar with. Um, get as much um, input and feedback from your potential customers and integrate that into the product and iterate as you go. So the faster uh, you do that, I think, the better it is. Perfect. Monique? Um, I sh going, uh, going in the same direction, so I think um, it was great to see the diversity of presenters today in terms of the problems they're solving in the industries that they're in, and I think at this stage, you know, all of them have products that they're really excited about and believe in, but um, to Shushi's point, I think, you know, a huge part of the work now is validating that with the customer in the market and demonstrating the ability to acquire those customers and keep them on the platform. Um, um, and then, you know, it actually in all, all three cases, there's a recurring, like, you know, how long can you keep them for that recurring revenue? Um, so, yeah, that's... Yeah, I'll just, I'll just pile on. Um, I, I don't think we're living in strange times today, but we just came out of them. Uh, 2021 was, was bananas. And, um, you know, the 0% interest rate environment is over, so it's incredibly important to get to product market fit because you're not likely to be able to raise tens of millions of dollars to sort of figure let that out like you have been able to uh, for the past couple of years. You're seeing these big stories, and a lot of this starts at the top. You know, we've got this denominator effect happening at universities and endowments, and until the private, or until the public markets uh, get back to the levels that they were at in, in 2021, there's just no allocation for venture capital and private equity at some of these institutions and endowments. So I think that uh, the trends that we've been seeing over the last 12 months are going to continue, and it's just really important to be a good fiduciary of your capital and make sure that you get to product market fit. That's your number one job as CEO is uh, do not run out of money. Mm -hmm. I love it. Great advice. Getting back to basics of lean startup methodology, conserving your resources and making sure you have the runway for the long-term game. All great advice. So again, please join me in thanking our panelists for their valuable feedback today. Thank you. Thanks, Sadie. Thank you, and I encourage you all, please do check out our startups. Give them some love, give them some support, and we hope to see you in the next session. Thanks, everybody.